uh, yeah, book of, book of Revelation, and we're in uh, chapter 12. I mean, we're going to go back to chapter 12. You might remember last Sunday morning, I went through chapter 12. Uh, yeah, just, just running like a whirlwind. And, and that's really whenever I came to the conclusion that I don't need to do it. On, I need to stop on Sunday morning because it, it, it's gotten to the point where um, the typology, the symbols, the, the, the things that are discussed are so bizarre that it can kind of get kind of out of whack for most people that just kind of come into a Sunday morning service, you know. When you come into a Sunday morning service, you, you may be invited by somebody to be here and um, and your friend said, hey, come to church with me. I think you'll like it and so forth. And I got to thinking myself, what in the world would somebody who probably hadn't been to church very much in their life do when they walked in and I'm reading some passage of scripture on the screen that talks about a woman in heaven having a child and a dragon flying around trying to eat the child, <laughs> you know, when it was born. And I thought to myself, you know, I might need to just kind of back up a little and uh, and offer this, yeah, offer this second half uh, to people who really, uh, you know, really want to come and, and didn't just kind of come in on something in a service and now they're kind of stuck, you know, because, I mean, they're here and they wanna, don't want to leave and yet... They don't really even know what you're talking about or anything about it. Yeah, yeah, it's like, oh, my goodness, what's he talking about? A dragon and a woman and a seven heads and ten horns and uh, seven crowns on his head and all of that. And anyway, so, so that's kind of where that came from. But you might remember that even when, when we first started, I kind of gave you a little forewarning about that, that when we get to a certain point, I may change it to Sunday night because um, of, you know, what it's about and, and how it goes. Because really, the, uh, the book of Revelation is written to reveal, uh, according to its own outline in chapter 1, things which, uh, ha which have been already, which we see in chapter 1, and that's the picture and the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. And... Uh, we've seen Jesus in his glory. We've seen Jesus in his power. We've seen Jesus as the Messiah, as the king. He's told us he's coming again. He's told us he's coming back to rule with a rod of iron. So there are some things that, we, we, that we've already seen. And so chapter 1 says, all right, well, you're gonna, what this book is about is about things that you already have seen and the things which are, which is the second portion of the book of Revelation, which is chapters, uh, basically chapter 2 through chapter 4, which give us the letters to the seven churches. And the seven churches, you might remember, are literal churches, real churches, in the land in Asia Minor, and there's Thyatira, Sardis, uh, Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, uh, Laodicea, you know, there there's seven churches, and Philadelphia, there. And each one of them is written a letter by the Lord. And John says, here's what the Lord has to say to the church at Ephesus and the church at Thyatira and the church at Sardis and the church at Laodicea. And as you go through the seven, seven churches, they are not only seven literal churches that exist in Asia Minor, but they're, but they're representative of churches throughout all of time. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a little bit of uh, probably each of those churches in every church. You know, there are some great people who love the Lord, willing to sacrifice, great followers of Christ. There are some that are playing games. There are some that are lukewarm and not serious about, about life. There are people that are willing to give their lives to the Lord and martyr themselves. And they're, in other words, they're, they're loving people and gracious people and hard people and evil people in, in, in every church. In, in every generation, but the seven churches are really the Lord's way of, of walking us through time to show us how church life is from the beginning to the end. And sadly, the end church, the church that is present when Christ comes to take us on home, is the church at Laodicea. And the church at Laodicea, the thing the Lord says to them is, you're not hot and you're not cold. Uh, you're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. 
uh, vomit you literally. And I'm not trying to just be graphic to say something, you know, kind of challenging like that. But, but that's, that's the word that's used. It, 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 it's not just, you know, it's not just kind of spit you out like gently, you know, you know. It's really, he said, you make me so sick that I'm, I'm, I, that I'm, I'm just violently, I'm going to just expel you out. And so th the point being that the last church, the church age, the church spirit, church nature of the last church that is going to be on this earth in the, in the age of grace is going to be a very compromised, uh, compromising, carnal, fleshy, man-focused, man-centered, uh, rules, regulations, uh, strategies. It might be, might be brilliant and flashy, and it may be uh, flamboyant, and it may be attractive, and it may be, you know, it may have uh, lots of bells, buzzers, and whistles, but it's, it, at its core, it's lukewarm. And the Lord says that uh, that's how church is going to be. And sadly, we, we're not going to be able to do anything about that. Uh, no matter how much we want to, we're not going to change that church age because, I mean, that's been written in prophecy for, well, the book of Revelation was written around 100, 100 uh, A.D., roughly 90 to 100 A.D., so for over 2,000 years, roughly, uh, it's been, <laughs> it has been written already in prophecy how the things are going to be. So, so the Lord wants us to know, and then he says, and then not only the things which you have seen and the things which are, but also the things which shall be hereafter. So most of the book of Revelation, starting in chapter 4 all the way through chapter 22, is about the things which shall be after the church age, after uh, in chapter 4, verse 1, you might remember. Just, just Is this helpful to kind of get you back in the flow of thinking about this? In chapter one, verse, chapter 4, verse 1, you remember the Lord looked at, at John and said, Come up here, and I'll show you great and mighty things which shall be hereafter. And so John was drawn up off the earth and, draw, and called up into heaven. And when he got up into heaven, he began to describe the throne of God. And, the, and the, the, he said creatures, when, when, and when, we, when he describes them, you know, they had four faces, one of a calf, one of a man, one of an eagle, one of a lion. And they had six wings, and they flew around the throne, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And he saw uh, thrones, 24 thrones, and 24 elders sitting on 24 thrones, uh, that had crowns on them, and they would cast the crowns at the foot of the lamb that was there and cry, worthy, worthy, worthy. And so it was really, it, uh, it, was a, it was a worship scene in heaven is what it really was. So John says, all right, uh, the first thing that happens is in the hereafter, what starts the hereafter is uh, we're called up. Now, of course, as Christians, we've heard all of our lives, and if you've been in church at all, you've probably heard messages on the rapture of the church. And the rapture of the church is just a, a word that is used to describe an event. Now, the word rapture is not in the Bible. If you try to look it up in a verse, you're not going to find it there. because, uh, And you're not going to find the word trinity either. So <laughs> that gives you an idea. Uh, those are just words that, are, that describe what the Scripture talks about, and it talks about this uh, snatching up, this calling away. And that's the word rapture, means to be caught out or to be, be snatched away. So the Bible and Jesus described, he said, uh, my, I'm going to come like a thief in the night, and if the good man of the house had known in what hour the thief would come, he wouldn't have allowed his house to be broken into. So watch, therefore, two shall be grinding in the mill, one shall be taken, one shall be left, two will be sleeping in bed, one will be taken, one will be left. Uh, and, of course, the only distinction between the one taken and the one left is that one is prepared and knows the Lord, and one doesn't know the Lord. So the event of the rapture, according to Jesus, and according to Daniel, and according to Zechariah, and according to Isaiah, and Zephaniah, and and Malachi and, and uh, Jesus himself in 24 and 25 is a real event that really happens, and it is a snatching away of those that are ready. You know, the parable of the ten virgins is all about that. Five of them had oil and five of them didn't have oil. 
the ones that didn't have oil wanted the ones with that wanted the ones with oil to give them some of theirs, and they said no. We're not. And and then and then the bridegroom came, and the five that were prepared went with the bridegroom, and the five that were unprepared didn't. So the point is that Jesus is coming. Yeah. Right, yeah. Before the tribulation, some people think the middle of the tribulation. Right. The great one tribulation, right, all of that. Right. How, how, how do you know, I mean, from, from text, you know, from, from chapter 4 and verse 2, come up here and I will show you what will, what must take place after these things. Right. What makes me think that that's the rapture well, yeah, of the church? What makes you think, well, it's, yeah, instead of this, yeah, John, come up here mm -hmm. and Right, yeah. So what makes, I mean, I just want to know your theory. Sure. We don't know. Until sure. We have, you know, I mean, anybody could be right. Right. But why do you think the, the whole church is going to be taken up? All right. Before the tribulation. All right. There, there are basically about three big reasons, and there are lots of smaller reasons that are tied up in maybe some intricacies in some verses here and there that kind of. They won't line up any other way except that. But there are three big reasons why I think this. Number one is uh, I don't think the Lord is a, is a wife abuser. Uh, we're his bride. You remember this. We're the bride of Christ. He loves us. And the, the question would be what would be the purpose of allowing us to go through this horrible period where we're going to be abused beaten, killed, murdered, and all of that. I mean, would he allow his bride, one he loved, one that was committed to him, and we're going to have a marriage supper of the Lamb one day, would, is he going to allow her to go through this horrible period and be abused and, and mistreated? Second reason, I know, and I know that's kind of an esoteric reason, and it's like, okay, well, you know, that's nice to think about, but, but you know, uh, I'm not sure that would be enough. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think he's a child abuser or a wife abuser. And so we're his child and we're his bride. And if he lets us go through this, he's allowing the devil to beat us and whip us and kill us and martyr us and all of that kind of stuff. Second, though, and which is a little more substantial, from the, from the first chapter to the beginning of the fourth chapter, the word church is mentioned about 30 times roughly. From the fourth chapter to the end, it's never mentioned again. So my assumption is because it's never mentioned again, it's not there. Because what he's doing in chapters 4 through 22 is describing what's happening. Like on earth, what's happening in heaven, what's happening in the future. And he never uses the word church ever again. So I'm thinking, okay, if he used it, this many times in these chapters and now he doesn't use it anymore for the rest there's a reason for that that it's not there and then third when the first scene that happens in heaven there are 24 elders sitting on 24 thrones that have some crowns on that they have received from the lord because of the works they have done in life they are not diadems and you remember I, i've made the distinction between this there are two words used for crown in the book of Revelation. One is diadem, which is the crown of a king of royalty. And the other is the crown that's a laurel wreath, like, like the winner of, a, of an Olympic event, like a, a champion's crown. Now, the Bible says to us in many places that our lives produce for us a crown, if we live faithfully and there are five crowns that are mentioned in the Bible that we can receive from the Lord one is the soul winners crown for people who win people to faith in the Lord one is the crown of life which we're given when we commit our heart to Jesus Christ one is the shepherd's crown or pastors receive uh, and there are five of these crowns that are mentioned the crown of righteousness for those who keep themselves clean and pure before God and so forth so when we get to heaven, according to 1 Corinthians 3, we go before the judgment seat of Christ. And it's clearly described in 1 Corinthians 3. 
and it says that that we're called before the judgment seat of Christ and our works are judged not our soul if we weren't saved we wouldn't be there we're only Christians are there and so we stand before Christ and we are judged according to what first Corinthians 3 says according to the works which we have done whether they be gold silver precious stone or wood hay and stubble and if our works are wood hay and stubble they're going to be burned up with the fiery judgment seat of Christ if they're going to if they're gold silver and precious stone they're going to endure and they're going to rise up as a reward for us of what of, of the work that we've done of what sort it is so in order for 24 elders to already be sitting on 24 thrones and have these crowns, there has to have been the judgment seat of Christ because that's where they get the crowns from. So the judgment seat of Christ happens when we get to heaven and we stand before the Lord one day and we're all standing there before the Lord because we're never judged until the end. I don't know if you've really paid attention to this or not, but the judgment seat of Christ is at the end, and the judgment seat of the lost, the great white throne judgment, is at the end of everything. And why is this? Well, it's because even when we die, we keep on living. And I'm not talking about we live in eternity. I'm talking about what we've done keeps on living. In other words, if I've been righteous and faithful and I've led people to the Lord and I've introduced into my children and my grandchildren the seed of the faith in God and they, they go on living a life that pleases Him. Right? Everything that is righteous and holy about my influence and my essence continues to move on with me all the way. And I, and I receive a reward on the same token if I've been deceptive and evil and unrighteous and lazy and sorry and pitiful and all of that and I pass that to my lineage then all of that's going to accumulate so see when we die we're not really dead because our influence and in our life still continues to live until the end and at the end it's all over boom then then we can evaluate what's happened totally with my life good or bad so uh, those are three pretty big reasons, I think, why I believe that. Yeah. Right. No problem. <laughs> Rick. I know. And I. Right. I, I'm not. No. Yeah. Around in, in the book of in, at the end of time, 
but this is a sign of some uh, entity that's going to be very powerful at the end of time, and it's going to be doing certain things. And so, you know, a lot of it, a lot of the, the interpretations has to be, you know, speculative, really. Um, and, and I'm just going to speculate uh, as to what I feel uh, the best description is and the best explanation is and what I think is reasonable and Holy Spirit logical. And because, you know, I, I, I don't know why sometimes we as Christians kind of get in the thought that spiritual explanations have to be strange, you know, they are, are illogical. Like somehow if it makes sense, it couldn't be God, you know, kind of a deal. But I, I think God is very r rational and God is very, very um, reasonable as far as the way he creates things and the way he moves things and that, and that the, 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 easiest un, the easiest explanation is, is the right explanation, and that it's not a uh, double-jointed, 16-cylinder, you know, twin-turbo explanations of things that, in other words, when you hear hoof, hoof beats, you think horses, you know, not zebras. Sometime it might be a zebra, but, uh, but, but most of the time it's going to be a horse. And uh, so we just kind of go with that that is obvious. And so, yeah, just, uh, yeah, any of you, if you have a question or if you have a point of view or something that you want to say, I mean, don't feel like I'm going to think you're the enemy or you're attacking me or something. I mean, really, if, 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 if what I say can't stand, then I don't need to be saying it. It's <laughs> what it boils down to. And if I don't have a reason for it and I can't tell you what that is, then you probably don't need to be listening to me <laughs> say anything about anything, to be honest with you. And yet we don't, you know. Yeah, right. That, so you can talk. Exactly. Exactly. And see, that, that question right there was probably a question that, that many people have about that. Well, why do you believe that? Uh, because, you know, you hear all kinds of explanations about this. You know, some people believe, now seriously, there, there, there's a, a preterist, and I don't mean to try to use these, use these crazy theological words, but there's a preterist view, and uh, this view is that all of this has already happened, that it happened when Jerusalem was ravished in 70 A.D., when the Romans, Titus the Roman general, came into Jerusalem, and, and didn't leave one stone upon another and plowed the grounds with, with plows and sowed salt in them so they wouldn't grow anything and ransacked and took the Jews into captivity. Now, a lot, some people, when they read the book of Revelation, they think that's what that book is about because that happened in 70 A.D. John wrote this in, in 90 A.D., and they think, okay, this is really everything to do with how that happened, who did it, and all that. And you think some weird explanations. You ought to, you ought to really look at some of those things, man. I mean, they're just bizarro. But anyway, the, the point is there have been lots of uh, discussion about it, lots of views on it and so forth. But the rapture happens, and, uh, and, and we're caught up. And then, and then John says, okay, the, the first thing is giant worship service in heaven and everything's going, and then, and then they look for someone in heaven who's able to open this scroll. They have this big scroll, and the scroll has seven seals on it, like, like and I picture in my mind like waxed seals. You know, you've seen some, yeah, with the ring, where a signet ring has been pressed into it. And what that is there to do is there to let you know whether these things have been violated or not. Because if it's broken, then somebody's been in there. So the seal, the scroll is sealed with these seven seals. And these seals are progressive. In other words, it's, it's not like seven seals. You've got to break all seven of them, and then you can start unscrolling it. The seals are so designed so that you can break one, and then you'll unscroll a certain section. And then you'll break the second one and unscroll another section. And third, and, and so forth. And the, and the scroll is designed as being so... Uh, filled with information that is written on the front side and the back side, uh, really, I think, indicating how, um, uh, how precise God is in, in, in his understanding of, it, of, of us and judgment and so forth. And so anyway, and, and, and then John starts crying because nobody is found in heaven or under heaven or in earth or under the earth, and he describes all that. And he says, and no one was found worthy to open the seal. 
and he weeps, he said, and, I, and I, I, I wept. And he said, then one of the elders came up and touched me and said, don't cry, John. There's somebody who's been found worthy. And he said, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And, of course, this makes John's heart go, whew, because that's what the Jews have always wanted, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the, the, the conquering king of the beast. The, the mighty champion, the powerful destroyer of the Romans and everybody else who would persecute the Jews, who would uh, have prejudice against the Jews. I mean, the Jews are like everybody else, y'all. Nobody likes to be the minority. Nobody likes to be uh, looked down on, belittled, uh, ridiculed, uh, treated falsely, uh, mistreated because somebody can, because you're, there are not many of you, and we're the, major, we're the majority, so we'll tell you what to do. And I, well, the Jews have always been treated this way, and so they were ready for their lion to come and, and take care of the foe so they wouldn't be treated that way anymore. And when John turns around and looks, he's thinking of this giant mane and roaring mouth, and then when he says, when I turned and looked, behold, a lamb was in the midst of the throne as if it were slain. In, in other words, the lamb standing at the throne had his throat cut and blood was running down him. When a, when a lamb was sacrificed, that's the way it happened. When you took the lamb to the altar and you were going to sacrifice the lamb, you held the lamb in your, in your arms like this and you took the knife and you cut him and his blood poured out, and you took the blood, and you put the blood on the altar to cover your sins. And this lamb standing at the altar was not only not a lion, but a lamb, but it was a lamb that was, had his throat cut. And John said, when he saw the lamb, he said the lamb was worthy, and the lamb came and took the scroll out of the, out of the strong angel's hand and began to break the seals. And you know, the seals were broken and the white horse came out, the red horse came out, the black horse came out, the pale green horse came out, the chlorophyll horse came out. You know, the color of death horse came out. That's what it boiled down to. David had seven mm -hmm. Yes, he does. Right, yeah. And, and as you get weaker, then it grows. Right. So if you have to go through weeds, so you get smaller, less you go through the mud. Yeah. It grows. And it grows you up. Right. So I like the way you said it. Yeah. You know, it makes you wise. It's very important to understand how to stand in the church. Right. But there's a lot of people you know that don't even, like, this judgment, the judgment on this great white throne. Mm-hmm. You know, and they just act the same. Right. Yeah, no. Yeah, they're not. does mm -hmm. that's right and that's why I say God is rational he's uh, he's logical uh, you know he created us we're created in the image of God and so the yeah the characteristics that we have been given are the characteristics that God has and our logic and our reason and our rational um, and, and all of the things about us are made in the image of, of God. And so, I mean, I mean, we're not limiting God. God can do anything, and I don't want you to think, you know, God's like, you know, he's limited like we are. He's unlimited, and he can do anything he wants to do. He can break every law he ever created, you know. He's, he's God. He can do whatever he wants to. 
But when you look at what he says and you look at how things happen, it's all logical. I mean, it, do, it makes sense. It, it follows a pattern. It, it has a progression, and, it, and it's true, and it's stable. And we depend on it being stable. I mean, uh, all of the way we operate depends on God staying stable. Like, when, if I took this right here and I let it go, it would fall down every time because there's a law called gravity. And everything in this world is based on that law staying true every time for God to be, to be firm on that, not changing. If I put this in a, in, a, in a freezer and it was below 32 degrees, I would expect this to freeze and not turn into steam because of God, the law of thermodynamics, and, the, and, and we, we, when we trust that. And in other words, uh, we depend on God being stable. But he begins to break these seven seals. And these seven seals are uh, extensions for lack of a better word, of activity that has already begun on earth. And, and I don't mean for that to sound spooky, but just so let me explain it so, so it'll hopefully make a little better sense. Right now on earth, we are being bombarded by the prince of the power of the air, of spiritual wickedness in high places, of principalities and powers, the Apostle Paul told us in, in Ephesians to put on the whole armor of God because we're fighting war and we're going to need to stand in this war and having done all to stand, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, that we wrestle against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. So we need to put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle of truth, have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, and we carry the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit, which is our only offensive weapon, which, is, which he says is the Word of God. That's not my translation. It says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we have five defensive weapons and one offensive weapon. Five things to protect us from the assault and one thing to go on the attack with. And that's how we fight the battle. So this is the spiritual battle that's going on right now. So as this battle rages, there are evil spirits, demonic influences, uh, principalities, powers, schemes, plans, assaults, uh, all intended to thwart God's ultimate plan and purpose. And Satan has one overwhelming passion in life, and that is to kill the Jews, exterminate the Jews. That is, seems to be his, his, his overwhelming passion. But basically, Satan has three things he wants to do. One, he wants to exterminate from this earth anything that reminds you that God has a purpose on this earth. So a covenant people would say, God has a purpose. Let's get rid of them. A church God has a purpose. Let's get rid of it. So he wants to eliminate from this earth anything that reminds us that God has a purpose. And then second, he wants to establish a, an order on this earth where it can be controlled by a single entity. And I'll give you three guesses who he wants to be that single entity. Himself. Yeah. Yeah. And then, thirdly, he wants the adoration and worship of the world. So if you say, what, what, what does Satan want? Well, he wants to eliminate anything that reminds him that God has a purpose. He wants to control and, and, synthesize, and synthesize everything under one world uh, leadership so that one person can have control and he's the person or he's the entity. And then he wants to be adored and worshiped by all of creation. Who is like the bee? Who is like the bees? Who can make war with him? Yeah. It sounds like deliverance. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, these, and this is true, and we have reflections is what I'm and what I'm saying to you, that's exactly what I'm saying about the seals. 
I'm just saying that the seals, as the seals are broken, what the seals do is take the fetters, take the, take the, the brakes off of this particular type of spirit so that the world now can just run at warp speed toward this, whatever this seal is, and it's not hindered because evil is being hindered at this moment. And I know you guys have heard me say it, but I'd love to say it because it, it, it's, it's the only hope we have. Right now, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the world is being protected from the, from the ultimate evil that the devil would do to it, which is he would mutilate it and destroy it totally. If Satan had his way, you would not exist. He would, he would kill you, mutilate you, destroy you, uh, plague you, trample you. I mean, he would, he would just have a whale of a time just destroying your life. And if you want to see the perfect example of look at the book of Job. When God removed the covering, so to speak, he pulled back the covering, the devil came in and could do anything he wanted to do in there, and then he, fa then he, then he ran up against the, the, the hedge that stopped the destroyer. So the first thing he did, killed all his kids. No, first thing he did, took all his money, took all his stuff, took his flocks, took his, all his businesses, his camel, his sheep. I mean, he's a multimillionaire. He goes to bed at night. He's a multimillionaire. He wakes up in the morning flat broke. And then, and then the devil says to God, God, it comes in God, and God looks at him and says, hey, did you get him to curse me? He said, no. But I tell you what, if you'll take that hedge back a little further, I'll get him to curse you to your face. And he said, all right, I'm going to pull it back, and you can take care of anything outside the hedge. And then Satan came down and killed all his kids. Seven sons and three daughters, all of them, boom. They're having a big meal at somebody's house or whatever, and the roof falls in, boom, all of them gone. All the grandkids, all the kids, all everything, gone, boom. One failed swoop. Satan comes back, God says, hey, did he, did he, did he curse me? No, but I tell you what. You draw that seal, you draw that back a little bit more, and I'll get him to curse you to his face. And God draws it back and says, okay, here's what, here's what you can do. You can do anything you want to to him. You just can't kill him. The only limit you have is you can't kill him. And Satan came down, put sores on his body, oh, oozing sores, and he ends up on the garbage heap of the city scraping his, wound, scraping his old, old sores that are oozing out with shells. And his wife is saying, why don't you go ahead and admit you're a sinner and you sinned against God and curse God and die? And he said, you are so foolish, woman. And then the whole book is about how his friends come in and accuse him of being a sinner, and that's why God's done these terrible things to him. But anyway, my point is, my point is, this is why we're doing this on Sunday night. My point is that this is the way evil operates. So if you're wondering how, what Satan wants to do, there's you a good example of what he would do to you. These things are already existing. Right, right. It would be the breaking of the seals is like God pulling back the covering. And, he, and the first seal that's broken, and I'm, I'm saying this because in these chapters, if we ever get to them, in these chapters, um, you, you, see, you see what happens when these seals actually break. You see stuff going on. The, in other words, uh, uh, chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, all of those chapters in there are, are giving you information that's happening behind the scenes of stuff you've already seen. But it just shows you, okay, this is what's going on in heaven while this white horse is riding out. Here's what's happening in heaven while this spirit of Antichrist on the white horse. You, you remember the white horse? What happened when he was loosed? Remember, he was a rider, and he had a crown on, but it wasn't a diadem. It was that laurel wreath crown. He wasn't a king, but he looked like a king, but he wasn't a king. And he came out, and he had a bow in his hand, but he didn't have any arrows. And he was going to be able to take control of the earth. So what does that mean? That means that this, the first thing that happens once we're gone, 
And once there's no godly influence on this earth and the Holy Spirit has been withdrawn and we've been withdrawn and there's no restraint to evil, the first thing that's going to happen is there's going to be someone who comes into this earth and takes over this earth in a bloodless coup. In other words, he, all right, he's not going, it's not going to be a war that makes him the king. He's going to, he's going to deceive the world. He's going, to, he's going to trick them. He's going to somehow gain control over them without having to fight a war because he's, he doesn't have any arrows, so it's a peaceful uh, a takeover is what it boils down to. Now, you look at this world today, and you tell me that that couldn't happen. I mean, before, I'm telling you, back when I first started preaching this in the 70s when I was young, and, and, and man, uh, the world was different in the 70s, you couldn't convince us. It was so hard to preach on this kind of stuff because everybody would be looking at you going, what are you talking about? Because America was America, man. I mean, we had a spirit of nationalism. We had a spirit of, of, of a unique nation that we're the, we're the greatest land. We're the greatest nation on the earth. There was no spirit of, of socialism and, 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 and communism and, and all of the isms that ought to be wasms that we have going on now. And, 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 and this one world order and the, and the UN and the, and the world police force and world... I mean, all of that didn't exist. And, it, and you, it was almost impossible to convince Americans that it would ever be that way. But now it's not hard to convince us, is it? Because we already see it. So when the rider of the white horse comes forth, it's just going to be the releasing of the restraint of that spirit, and it's going to allow that spirit to just begin to run rampant like a, like a, like a fever in a body without any antibiotics to stop it, just everywhere. And then comes the red horse, and of course the red horse is, is, uh, is, is blood and, and death and all of those kind of things that begin to happen when somebody takes over the world and he begins to eliminate people that don't agree with him. And, and we have leaders now in, in little kingdoms all over the world killing their own people. Yeah, genocide, <laughs> genocide. Uh, uh, law, I mean, just take your people out and line them up and dig a trench and, you know, or bomb them or, or give them some poison gas or, you know, eliminate thousands. I mean, this is what happens. And so uh, the red horse comes and then the black horse, you know, famine and plague and a, and, a, and, a, and a day's wages for a quart of wheat that's basically enough food to keep you alive for a day, not your family, just you. And so people are going to be facing the quandary of, not just paying their bills, their house note, their car note, the cable bill, whatever it might be, they're going to be looking at how am I going to stay alive because inflation has hit, has hit so bad that it's going to cost me what I make in a day to buy enough wheat to keep myself alive or enough food to keep myself alive, not even counting my kids, my wife, or anybody else, not counting paying the house note, car note, any of the other bills. I was talking about just... Everything you make is going to be, have to be spent to keep you alive for one more day. And it's just going to be released. And see, the desperate, I mean, do you feel the desperation that begins to happen? And then, and, and then of course, you know, comes the pale horse, and that's the death. And, of course, people die, and people, people uh, families die, people die, nations die, countries die, uh, populations die on this earth and all that begins to happen during the breaking of these seals and then the seals are broken and there's a silence there's a little intermission you might notice on your notes it says the second intermission well the first intermission tells us what was going on in heaven while all of that seal breaking was going on on earth and what God was doing in heaven and then there there comes, a, there comes a command on the last seal when the seventh seal is broken. The seventh seal opens up seven trumpets. So with the breaking of the seventh seal, it automatically moves into the sounding of the first trumpet. 
And the sounding of the first trumpet brings, you know, hail and fire from heaven falling on the earth. And, and it says fire mingled with blood falling on the earth, describing these catastrophic things that begin to happen to the earth. In the, in the breaking of the seals, it's people that get damaged. In the blowing of the trumpets, it's the earth that's being attacked. You remember the judgment on creation back in Genesis was he looked at the man and he said, because you've sinned, you're going to be cursed by the sweat of your face. You're going to earn your living. You're going to toil and struggle. And, and women are going to have pain in childbirth and and it's going to be travail and so forth. And he looked at the earth and he says, thorns and thistles, or you'll be growing and so forth. And I mean, there's a judgment on all of creation because of sin. And so here with the seven seals, uh, seven trumpets, now you have the earth being attacked. And then the second seal is broken and this meteor falls out. I mean, second trumpet sounds and the meteor falls out. And a third of the, of the seas turn to blood. A third of the ships are are, are wiped off the face of the earth, probably a giant tsunami or something. It just captur you know, captures them, and, and a third of the people die on the earth. And, and so you have all of the, 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 the basic uh, judgments on the earth. The, the fourth trumpet sounds, a third of the stars go dark, a third of the sun goes dark, the moon goes dark, and so you have all these catastrophic things. And then the bottomless pit is opened up, and uh, these demon locusts come out, and they... And they Right, and they and they right, and they they can't kill you, but they can make you have pain for five months. And I mean, it's a vivid description of of what looks like a uh, a war uh, attack, uh, where some place is attacked. Most likely, and and this is just this is one of those things that you that you'd be speculating on. When the fifth trumpet blows, most likely that is. A triggering event that triggers everything that follows behind that in other words the fifth trumpet releases some uh, figures John tries to describe when he's never seen it before I mean how would you how would you describe an Apache attack helicopter how would, I mean if you've never seen one what would you say it looked like a big locust man <laughs> That's what he said. I mean, they've never seen an airplane before. They've never seen a helicopter. And he said, and that thing had a tail, and it shot fire out of its tail. And it shot fire out of its mouth, and it sounded like thousands of chariots at the same time, you know. And it had wings, and it just flew in every direction, and it was just unbelievable, and it had a face like a man. Look in it, and you could see the man's face, you know. I mean, he's just clearly describing a modern warfare. I mean, to me, I, I can't, I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, it sounds just like that. And then these demon locusts attack a city. So they're probably going to bomb one of the cities in Turkey, most likely. And, of course, what that's going to do is trigger a world war. And the sixth trumpet blows, and the armies from the north start coming down. Now, this is not the Battle of Armageddon. I know that many people look at that battle that happens and they think this is the battle, this is the, the battle of Armageddon. But I, I showed you back then there are lots of differences between these two battles. This battle is most likely the battle that's described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, there is a war that happens during the tribulation period that is a world war that is worse than any war that has ever been fought on the face of this earth, and it's going to be fought in the Holy Land at, at, at the nation of Israel, and these armies from the north are going to come down, and they're going to attack, and the armies from the south are going to attack, and the east, now not, not, not the far east, they'll be later, the Chinese and those will come at the Battle of Armageddon, but these are the armies of the east, like east of Jerusalem is ba what's ba what is called Babylon, modern-day Iran. And Iran, yeah, and those come and, and, and they attack, and then Ethiopia and Libya and all of them from the, from the south, and then from the north, you got Turkey and Russia and all. And, and it's a big confederation to come against tiny little Israel, and of course, Israel routes them and plunders them, 
And the Bible says in Ezekiel 38 that it takes them seven months to bury the dead. And they have enough fuel because they capture the enemy's tanks and planes and weapons and munitions to, fun, to, fuel, to fund themselves for seven years, which is exactly how long the tribulation lasts. And so this is, a, this is when the sixth trumpet blows. Well, between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, there's this big intermission, and that's where we are now. And this intermission tells us while the trumpets are blowing, this is what's happening in heaven. So you'll know what's going on behind the scenes because when these trumpets start blowing, stuff starts happening on the earth. Well, there's also something going on in the spirit realm. It's not just hail and fire falling out of the sky and I saw uh, Satan fall from heaven like lightning flashing and he had the keys to the abyss and he opened the door and the demon locust flew out. I mean, this is what's happening physically on earth, but behind the scenes, these spiritual things are happening and they're reflected with what's going on on earth. So the Lord wants us to know what's going on in heaven, not just what's going on on earth. And so we have the second intermission. And by intermission, I mean break in activity. You have six seals, break, 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 boop, come to a couple of chapters. Uh-oh, let me show you what's going on. So the action doesn't move forward. It just, like, puts it on pause and says, all right, here's what's going on in heaven while all this is happening. And then once it gets through with an explanation of that, then boom, uh, the seal's broken and seven trumpets start blaring. Boom, 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 boom. When it gets to the sixth trumpet, boom, stop. Let me tell you what's going on in heaven while these trumpets are blowing on earth. And then as soon as he finishes that, then he's going to blow that seventh trumpet. And when he blows that seventh trumpet, it's going to open up seven bowls of wrath which is the final, final thing that's going to be on this earth. And it's just the destruction of the earth is what it boils down to. The bowls of wrath are, there's no mercy, there's, no, there's nothing you can do anymore. Uh, uh, and, and I say that because all through the seals and all through the trumpets, there's an opportunity for someone to be saved. I mean, should they want to be a martyr? Should they want to be killed by the Antichrist for their faith? Should they want to be tortured and plundered and mutilated and their family killed and them killed? And, you know, if you want to do that, you can trust Christ. So you still have a chance, is what I'm saying, whether you're Jew or Gentile. You can, in spite of all of the judgment and destruction and everything, you can still repent. And everywhere along the way, you're given an opportunity to repent. Like with the blowing of the trumpets, remember? It says, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Not all of it, a third of it. Why? That means you still have a chance. It's not all gone. You can turn, you can come. But if you come, know that you're going to be a martyr and, and, and you're going to be killed and mutilated. And, and that's why there, there will be people saved. You remember there are 144,000 Apostle Pauls that are preaching the gospel on this earth that the devil cannot do one thing about. They can't, he can't touch a hair of their head because they have a seal of God on them and he can't touch them. They can go anywhere, they can say anything, they can do anything, and he can't touch them. No matter how hard he wants to, they are sealed by God, and they are evangels of those last days, and they are they're giving folks an opportunity to come to him. And they obviously have been influenced. You say, how did they get saved? Because there are 12,000 from, 12 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, we know that the 12 tribes of Israel do not accept Christ as a Messiah. That right now, even right now, they do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and is their Savior and their Messiah. They will believe this one day, and we'll get to it, and you'll see it, and it's great. But they don't believe it right now. And so how 
do 144,000 of them become convinced that Jesus is the Messiah so that they can be sealed and they'll have in their heart the gospel of Jesus Christ to go preach during this horrible tr period of tribulation. Well, we know that we know what happens to them because the Bible tells us that during the first three and a half years, there are two witnesses that are released on this earth. And these two witnesses, and we know this because in this intermission, it tells us this. And these two, these two witnesses are so powerful that they can shoot fire out of their mouth. Right. And they can call plagues down on the earth. And they can pronounce droughts on this earth. They, they are so powerful that they can do all of these things. And the Antichrist has no power against them. They can torture him. They can, they can kill him. I mean, they have the power to do anything. And he can't touch them until God's finished with them. And when God's finished with them, then he removes his covering. And the Antichrist is going to kill them. Well, during the first three and a half years, we have to believe that these 144,000 Jewish people are influenced by these two witnesses because these two witnesses are Jewish. They're prophets. Uh, they're, you know, in, in Malachi, it says, before the coming of the Lord, uh, the, the, the prophet Elijah will come. Well, we know that John the Baptist was the prophet. It was in the spirit of the prophet Elijah. Well, just like before Jesus came, that spirit, there'll be another spirit of the prophet Elijah. So a lot of people say, okay, Elijah's going to be one of the two witnesses. And, you know, whether it's physically Elijah, you know, Elijah was carried up into heaven by a whirlwind. You remember? Yeah. In other words, Elijah didn't die. Right. That's right. See, uh, here, here's the thing and this is just uh, shows you a kind of a logic and, and, and why you would try to speculate who these two witnesses are, is remember in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, I think it's verse 23, uh, it says, As it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. So Hebrews says that all men are going to die once on this earth. So... That means if you've died one time, you're not going to die on this earth again. You ain't come back and die again. So there are only two people that have ever lived on this earth that did not die. One was the prophet Elijah who was taken off of the earth in the chariot of fire. You remember and Elisha saw him and the mantle fell down and Elisha got it and said, will this thing still work for me? Boom, and the Jordan parts and... He's off to the races and does twice as much as Elijah did. I mean, he, God answered the prayer, you know. And, and, uh, and, and then the other one was old man Enoch. The Bible tells us about Enoch, and Enoch walked with God and was not. That's all it says. In other words, Enoch's walking down the road one day, and everybody going, Hey, Enoch, good to see you, buddy. Hey, what the old man... And then all of a sudden, they go, whoa, where did Enoch go? Somebody said, did you, did you see what? Did he fall in the ditch up there? What happened to him? And they were, I mean, he was just walking down the road, and all of a sudden, he was gone. So there are only two people that have never died once, and that is Enoch. Even Jesus died, Enoch and Elijah. So if you say, who are the two witnesses? Well, it's either going to be physically Enoch and Elijah, and I have no idea what they look like, and I don't know how bizarre it would be, but I wouldn't put it past God to actually have these old, two Old Testament guys looking like Old Testament guys just going around tormenting the, be the Antichrist. I mean, basically, I mean, you know, we're talking about they're witnessing to Jewish people. So the Jewish people will respect them because that's Elijah, man. Good night. Boy, he's one of our heroes. And then I know you don't know it because you don't know much about Enoch. Because the Bible doesn't, the Bible, our Bible doesn't have very much about Enoch in it. But I'm going to tell you, Jewish history is full of Enoch. Enoch wrote a book, as a matter of fact, the book of Enoch. 
It's not in the Bible, but it's in the Apocrypha, which is, you know, the books of spiritual writings that uh, the compilers of the Word might, didn't think really would fit within the, within the Word, but they were spiritual writings and they were worthy to look at. You know, the book of Maccabees and Enoch, and there are lots of books, Jonah, all these books. But Enoch wrote, and, and the book of Enoch was used in the early church a lot. So Enoch was a very well-respected prophet of God and a very well-known prophet of God. So I'm just saying to you that the Jews will recognize Enoch as being a wonderful, great man of God. And I'm, I'm just saying it, I wouldn't put it past God to use the staging of these two Old Testament-looking cats walking around, and the Jews are going, my, the Jews are so impressed because they respect these people totally. And when they talk, boy, and then they're powerful, and they can torment this old demon that's up here, and they can do anything, and he can't harm them, and they can just laugh in his face and blow fire on him and, you know, kill him, wound him. You know, the, 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 one of the things that's going to happen during this intermission is going to be is this... Uh, this uh, seven-head, ten-horn, uh, seven-crowned dragon, one of his heads is going to be wounded. It says an immortal wound. In other words, one of these heads represent the Antichrist. This beast flying around is, is Satan, and it says he, he has seven heads, which represent seven kingdoms, which give him his power, which most likely are... European nations, Britain, France, these old Roman Empire stuff. And that's where he gets his power from. And one of these heads is going to be mortally wounded. Who did it? Who could, who could kill him? There's only, there are only two people that could kill him, and that's the two witnesses. In other words, the two, I think the two witnesses kill him. They actually slay him right there. And then the devil brings him back to life resurrects him, which is obviously an imitation of Jesus Christ, you know. Jesus was resurrected. The devil said, I can resurrect people. And, once the, and, and, when the, and when the Antichrist is resurrected, and you'll see this, it's written right there in the Scripture. This is not, I know it might sound bizarre, but it's right there. We'll read it if I ever get to it. But, <laughs> but, um, but it, not tonight. No, we won't get it tonight. But but it says that once the devil brings him back to life, the people of the earth are so impressed and awe-stricken that they just fall down and start worshiping him. I mean, he, he becomes like a, a, a god to them. And then, of course, the two witnesses are killed on the streets of Jerusalem. You remember this. And they lay there three and a half days. They're not even, they're not even buried they're just laying on the street down there. And the people in Jerusalem and people from all over the world see them. Now, that was another thing back in the 70s that was hard to imagine how that was going to happen before, because we didn't have satellites. We didn't have the Internet. We didn't have worldwide something happens and everybody in the world sees it at the same time, at the same moment, boom, everything. But now, that's not hard to believe. I mean, huh, we can see a gnat's whisker in China right now. I mean, you know. I mean, you can probably zoom into your house right now and tell if somebody's climbing in the window or whatever, you know. And, and, it's, and, and so these witnesses lay there on the street, and everybody comes by them. And you remember the passages that we read, and it said that everybody came by them and looked at them and, and just uh, had a celebration and a party. Yeah, and, and it does. It says, and they gave presents to each other. Just like, okay, it's Christmas. Of course, Christmas would have long passed because they didn't honor Christ anyway. But this becomes like this fake Christmas where they, they're so happy that these tormentors, because, I mean, remember now, the world is filled with sin. The world is filled with rebellion. There are no restraints of the Holy Spirit. Men are just as wicked as demons, and they're doing anything they want to do. The world has finally gotten what it has always wanted, as much sin as it can have, and it just has gone wild. And the only flies in the ointment are these two witnesses that keep showing up, pooping every party. You, you're celebrating. You got this big giant stadium event where these rock bands are singing to the devil and the Antichrist, and all of a sudden, guess who shows up? These two freaks. 
And they start shooting fire out of their mouth, and they're trying to be attacked by the mobs, and it just bounces all off of them. And they're saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, I mean, they are just pooping every party around. And the beast can't do anything about it, and the false prophet can't do anything about it, and the dragon can't do anything about it. And finally, man, finally, they are, they are dead, and they're laying in the streets, and we are so happy that they're gone because they have tortured and tormented us for three and a half years. And they have a party over it. They just let the bodies lay there. And then all of a sudden, after three and a half days, that old stiff arm starts to move, and that old corpsey-looking skin starts turning pink again. And those eyes begin to flutter a little bit. And then all of a sudden, boom, man, they're just carried right on up into heaven, just like that, resurrected and taken straight to heaven, right in front of all those people. And then the only ones left on earth after that are the 144,000 that he can't touch because they've been sealed by God. And they preach the gospel. So the world has some influence. There's still time to be saved. He offers things like, and let him, these are, this is, these are the phrases, and let him who has ears hear what the Spirit of God says. In other words, you can still hear it. If you'll listen, please listen to it. There's a chance for you to repent. You don't, you don't have to, 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 to stand at the great white throne. You don't have to be tortured in an abyss forever in the lake of fire. I, the door is still open. And, and notice, it, it's, it's, he's not talking to groups of people. He's talking to individuals. Let him who has ears to hear, not they, not giant big group. If you as a person, as an individual, if you will listen, you can come to me. Well, in this second intermission, at the end of chapter 13, never hear that phrase again. It's gone. That's the last chance. That's the last. And from what? And then what happens from then on is nothing but the wrath of God being poured out on this world and on this evil and on these spirits. And and Satan, who has defiled heaven and earth. You remember, sin started in heaven. You remember this, right? Sin didn't start on earth. Sin started in heaven. When Lucifer rebelled against God, before the earth was, was even created, Lucifer rebelled and said, and this is Isaiah 14 if you want to read it. And Lucifer said, I, why does God have to be the boss? I'm, I'm prettier than he is. I'm bigger than he is. I'm more impressive than he is. I'm the man. And I, my throne's going to rise above his throne, and I'm going to be greater than, he's, than he is. And all of a sudden, God just unceremonially boot you out. I mean, threw the joker right out into the air. And he becomes the prince of the power of the air, the little P. Because, you know, a prince is always subject to a king. So he becomes the prince of the power of the air. He's kicked out into the air. And then in, in Revelation, he's not, and then he's kicked out of the air down, down to the earth. And he's kicked to the earth down to the abyss. And he's kicked from the abyss down to the lake of fire. I mean, his progression is definitely downward. And he becomes more and more enraged every step down. Every step down, he becomes more enraged. When he gets down to the earth, he's so enraged that, that he, just, he just wants to kill and destroy and Murder, because the Bible says, for he knows he has but a short time. He's read the book. He, knows. he knows. That's right. That's exactly right. He, right. He knows what's going to happen. That's right. He knows what's going to happen. And and if you'll if you'll remember, and I, let me let me just let me scroll in here, and I'm going to find something. All right. Let me see if I can get that to come. Yeah, there it is. All right. I. I, I I just had this in, in between some of the scripture. I, want, I, I just want you to see what Satan has tried to do to stop the child that is born, the one that the dragon's trying to eat, you know, when it's born. 
what Satan has tried to do to kill this child ever since the beginning. I mean, look, I just wrote a few of those things down. Satan thwarted God's plan for humanity by seducing Adam and Eve and enticing them to rebel against God. So, see, God's plan was that man would have a wonderful earth, occupy an Eden forever, have life easy and not have to work and sweat and toil, and the only thing they would have to do is meet with him each day, and he could enjoy them, and they could enjoy him. And the devil said, I'll never let that happen. And he came in, and he seduced Eve. And then Eve uh, spoke to Adam, and then Adam made a decision to fall. And the devil said, I got him now. And so Adam and Eve was an attempt to stop God's purpose from happening to kill the child before he was even born. And then uh, he had plans to destroy or corrupt God, the godly messianic line. What happens from the time of the Garden of Eden is, God says, you remember in the Garden of Eden what he says? He said to the woman, you're, you're going to have a seed. And this seed is going to grow up, and this seed is going to crush his head. So that was a prophecy that from woman there was going to come one day a child that was going to be able to crush the head of Satan. So all the way from that point on, Satan said, all right, if I can destroy the lineage from Eve and Adam, I can stop this child from being born. If I can pollute the line, if I can can defile the lineage, then the Messiah can't come because nobody knows who came from who and it's defiled. And so here's what started trying to happen. He prompted Cain to kill Abel. The first two people on this earth were Cain and Abel. You're right. You remember? And so Cain kills Abel. So the devil says, if I can get them to destroy their lineage, boom. And then, so Cain kills Abel, and Cain gets banished, and Abel's there. But there's another child, and his name is Seth. And then, and so Satan tries to defile the line of Seth and get it polluted. And then uh, Abraham comes along, and he's, you know, the lineage is going to come through Abraham. And then uh, Abraham doesn't have a, they don't have a son. And Sarah is old, you remember, and she gets pregnant. And and even though she's old and God says, okay, I'm going to make a covenant with you and I'm going to bless you and the earth's going to be blessed through you and so forth. But you remember before Sarah uh, ever got pregnant with God's child, uh, they went into a kingdom and Abraham said that Sarah was his sister, right? Because they were afraid. He was afraid she was so beautiful. She's 90 years old, but she's so attractive that Abraham thinks they're going to kill him because they want her. So I'll tell them you're my sister, and that way they won't have to kill me. Well, if Sarah had been violated, then that would have stopped the godly line. That line would have been polluted right there. The devil could have stopped Christ from being born if he could have, if he could have seduced somebody into raping Sarah during that moment. And you remember what the king said. The king looked at Abraham, and the king says, What have you done? Because all of a sudden, the judgment of God had begun to fall on them. And so the king starts looking around saying, what's happening here? And then he looks out the window and he sees Abraham and Sarah down there sitting on a bench, nuzzling each other and kissing and all that. And he says, that's not his sister. You don't do that with your, you don't do that with your sister. And then he, then he confronts Abraham and he said, what have you done to us? You told us that was your sister, and it's obviously not your sister because I saw what you were doing, and you don't do that with your sister. And because you've said this to us, your God is is mad at us, and and so you got to go now. Get out. Get everything and get out. But Satan was trying to stop the messianic line by getting somebody to violate Sarah. And then you remember they had the son Isaac? And what did Isaac do? Isaac's traveling around, does the same thing his daddy did. Rebecca, his wife, she's so beautiful. Isaac said, it worked for dad, maybe it'll work for me. <laughs> and so they went into this place, and he said, that's my sister. And he said, great. And, 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 and then the same thing happened. The king says, 
The king says, yeah, I'll bring her here. We're gonna... And then all of a sudden, man, stuff, terrible plagues and violence uh, start happening. And the, and the king sees Isaac and Rebekah, and he says, what have you done to me? You know, and get her and get out of here. Well, if, if, if the devil could have gotten somebody to violate Rebekah, boom, the messianic line would be stopped and no child born. You can stop Jesus, the Messiah. And then the Israelites uh, tried, they killed all the male Israel, Israel, uh, children of Israel. You remember this? When, when Moses was there and, they, and God had called Moses and they, Moses was just a baby floating in the bulrushes and uh, the king heard of this, Pharaoh heard of this and so he said, all right, kill all the Israelite babies under two, from two years old under. And they started doing it, and Moses' mother took him and floated him in a basket, and the Pharaoh's daughter found him. But if God could have had Moses killed, boom, that would have been the end of it. And then Saul tried to kill David. You remember? He threw javelins at him and did everything. And also, and I didn't put it up there, but, um, but uh, David's son. Yeah. Absalom had a rebellion against his own dad, trying to take the kingdom away from him. And then, and, and, and then, yeah, right, yeah. That was a great little deal when he was riding down, and he had long hair. That's, back, back in the 70s, the preachers tried to use that to say why you shouldn't have long hair. Mm -hmm. They said, look at what happened to Absalom. Absalom had this long hair, and he's riding on this little donkey, and, uh, and uh, he rode under a limb, and his long hair got tangled up in the limb, and it pulled him off the back of his donkey, and he's hanging there like a pinata. And uh, and and uh, I think was it Nathan or was it Abner? Uh, it, the great general, David's great general, yeah, Joab, great general. Uh, David had had given him one order. You know what his order was? Don't hurt Absalom. Don't hurt Absalom. Well, the the general knew, David, you you are a dysfunctional father. And this. This person is trying to take the kingdom away, so I'm sure going to kill him. Now, he didn't tell David that. They said, oh, yes, sir, we will, we will not hurt him in, at all. Uh, and so here, co here he comes, and he, and he sees Absalom hanging in a tree, and he got his soldiers around him, and, and, and the Bible says that they just filled him with javelins. He was like a pinata. I mean, they just they mutilated him. They killed him. And then he comes into David, and he says, oh, David, I got some uh, good news and some bad news. He said, uh, the good news is you're not going to have to worry about anybody taking over your kingdom, and the bad news is we killed Absalom. And then David started crying and pouting and snot and all that kind of stuff. And then you know what the general said to him? He said, you better, you better dry it up, pal. He said, these men have been fighting for you, and they see you crying over that reprobate, rebellious one trying to take your kingdom away, and you're disrespecting them and dishonoring their sacrifice by crying over the one that you ought to be happy about and, and being angry at them, the ones that have given themselves for you. You better cry. You better, better wipe that nose of yours, and you better get out there and thank those people. And, man, I mean, he, he read him the riot act. And David did it, and... You know, that's, so the kingdom was saved. But if the kingdom had, could have been taken away, the, the Messiah couldn't have been born because there would be no line for which the Messiah could be born to. And then, of course, in the day of Esther, I, put, I used to preach a message called uh, the horrible hanging of hateful... No, let's see. The, what was it? Of, hate, of hateful haughty Haman. The horrible hanging of hateful haughty Haman. Haman was, you know, in Esther's day, Queen Esther, the book of Esther, uh, was one that tried to kill uh, all the Jews. And, and you remember how the tables got turned. He built some gallows in the city in order to hang the Jews on. And then Esther and her uncle Mordecai saved the king from being killed by some people that were trying to kill him. And, and the king says, what, what, do you, what can I do for you that's great? And, and she said, uh, can you not kill, can you rescind that order that all the Jews should be hung on these, uh, on this gallows that had been built out here? And he said, what? And she said, yeah, I'm a Jew. See, he didn't even know it. And so you've just signed an order that is going to kill me on that. And then the king got so hot and said, who has done this is going to die on the gallows himself? And man, who's deceived? And then all of a sudden now Haman, who thought, he was going to hang all them on the gallows. 
Now he gets hung on his own gallows that he has built. And that's where the phrase, who knows, Mor Esther didn't want to do this. She was afraid, and Mordecai, her uncle, looked at her and said, who knows, but, but you were born for such a time as this. That's where that phrase comes from. Esther says, okay, I'll do it. So anyway, I I'm just saying to you, that look at how the devil has tried to kill the child before it was even conceived and born. And if he could have done any of those, I mean, think about the little threads that, 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 the, that the, the, the kingdom of God hung on, that if one little thread had unraveled, there would be no Messiah because there would be no lineage from which he could be born. So the devil has always tried to kill Jesus. And practically every religious leader or every world leader in the world, I'm going to quit with this, y'all, so relax. But let me see if I can get it to you. Every world leader has tried to exterminate the Jews. You know, I told you that, the, the, that this uh, dragon, he's going to eat this child. He, the, the, the woman's birthing the child. And you know the woman's Israel and the child Jesus, right? All right, and the devil's the dragon sitting there ready to eat the baby when he comes out. And, but she has the baby, and the baby becomes the man-child, and he prospers, and he's the one that rules with a rod of iron. We, we'll read that. But just to show you what every, practically every world leader has tried to exterminate the Jews. Look at that. Uh, Pharaoh in Moses' day tried to eliminate the Jews. Haman in Esther's day. Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel's day. Darius the Mede of the Medes and Persians. Herod in Jesus' day. Canute, which was a leader in England about a thousand years ago. Edward the Second, which is long, or Edward the First, which is Longshanks. You remember, uh, what is that, Mel Gibson? Uh, Braveheart. Braveheart. That's Edward I, Longshanks. Tried to kill all, drove all the Jews from England's shore. France and Germany blamed them for the Black Plague. Spain, about the same time Columbus was, uh, was here in America, Spain drove out, drove the Jews out of their kingdom. Hitler, well, you know what he did. And Russia and the Arab states now are the chief persecutors of Israel. I mean, I'm just showing you, that's what's happened to them all the way through. The most persecuted people that have ever lived on this earth. And yet the purest people that have ever lived. The proudest people. The proudest, yeah, right. The, proud, the most proud, the most pure people. In spite of, right, in spite of everything. And, and I'm just saying that the book of Revelation points these things out and says, this is, what, this is what God's plan has been. This is what it's been all through the ages. And God's going to accomplish his plan. And here's how it's going to happen, and here's what it's going to look like. Now, that's what the rest of the book is about from there on. All right, so can y'all remember all of that kind of stuff? <laughs> okay. I know it. I know it. They've been blinded, hadn't they? Mm-hmm. You know, they are going to believe it, though, one day. Yeah, Jesus. here's what Jesus said, and, and, I'll, and I really will quit with this. Jesus, in Matthew, Matthew 24 and 25, is describing what the Jews are going to, what, what they're going to do in the last days. These are to the Jews. The Jews, Jewish disciples said, what will be the sign of your coming and what will be the sign of the end of the age? And then Jesus starts talking. He says, well, you're going to hear wars and rumors of war, but don't be troubled about that. And then he's going to say, many are going to rise in my name and they're going to say, I'm the Christ and don't follow them. And he said that they're going to try to kill you and they're going to try to abuse you and they're going to try to do all of these things to you and pray that your flight that you're running away from this won't be when you're with child or on the Sabbath day because you could only travel a certain number, a certain a mile on a Sabbath day. So pray that it's not the Sabbath day when you start running from the Antichrist because you're going to have to run fast and far. And then he says, and he that endures to the end shall be saved. And that has nothing to do with you and me. That's not he's talking to the Jews. And he's what he's saying. If you can make it to the end, you're going to see me come down to rescue you. And we know this because Zechariah says that Jesus is going to come out of the clouds and he's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. 
and this, uh, and this Mount of Olives is going to split, and the Jews that see this happen are going to look at him, and they're going to say, where did you get those wounds? And he's going to say, in the house of my friend. And they're going to fall down and repent and put on sackcloth. And it says, and then shall a, a fountain for sin be opened in the city of Jerusalem. In other words, Israel is going to believe in their Messiah. But it's only going to be those that see it happen. So if you endure to the end, you shall be saved. You're going to, you're going to know me. You're going to come to me. So anyway, point being that uh, God's plan is going to be accomplished. His plan is to keep the covenant with his people that he promised through Abraham and remnant. all remnant. Yeah, through all the things. Just a remnant, just a little bit. Can you imagine? Because right now in the book of Revelation at chapter 12, about three-fourths of the people that have ever lived on the earth are dead. Right by, by chapter 12, you know, a third died and a fourth died and then a third. And then you had all these martyrs and third. Now you got, now you got about one quarter of the population. of If, let's just say, um, seven billion people, which is about what it is now on the earth. Let's say, let's say a billion, and I'm being liberal, uh, go to heaven in the rapture. Well, that leaves six billion on the earth. By the time you get to chapter 12, you got about two billion people left out of the six billion that were left after the rapture. You got about two billion people left. So you're weeding them out fast. Yeah. All right.